Okay, we are live. A trial 11 years in the making has been in progress in Albany, New York. Oral Nick Hillary, who was the prime suspect in the 2011 murder of his ex-girlfriend's 12-year-old son, Garrett Phillips, is suing the Potsdam police for unreasonable search and seizure, as well as unnecessary detainment. Hillary was acquitted by a judge of the murder of Garrett Phillips in 2016. Thomas Mortati, who represented the town of Potsdam in the early phases of this lawsuit, is here with me. He's been in the courtroom and he's here to tell all. Welcome, Tom Mortati. Nice to be back with you, Roberta. So I, I don't think I gave you a very good introduction. You're a, a, you're a civil attorney. You work with the plaintiff side now. Right. Um, so I was on the defense side 26 years and five years ago, I left my old firm and uh, I had represented the village of Potsdam in, and uh, some of their mem police members from the beginning of the case back in to the civil case back in 2012 and the early, uh, you know, few months after the unfortunate homicide of Garrett Phillips all the way through when I left my old firm in September, October of 2017. So I lived with the case for a little over five years. So before we get into what happened in court, why did the police hone in on Nick Hillary? So interesting, Roberta. So the police didn't just hone in on Nick Hillary. In fact, on the night of the murder, um, there were rumors, there was speculation that it was possible that, that Garrett might have been involved in some peer-to-peer -peer incident, uh, maybe a bullying, maybe, who knows? Nobody really knew. And they knew two of the kids that he was playing basketball with that afternoon. Now, they're, these are adults now. Uh, but a uh, young uh, Rice boy and a uh, uh, young Reagan boy. Well, that night, a state police investigator went to both of those kids' houses, met with their parents, and interviewed both kids, had them, uh, they were in shorts and t-shirts, had them take their socks and shoes off to examine them for any injuries, any wounds, any signs of a scuffle, a struggle, nothing. So that was one of the very first rumors, literally the night of the murder. So they were able to basically effectively rule those two kids and this whole theory out of a possible who knows what, uh, even if it was just an accident, kids were horsing around type thing. So it was after that, into the early morning hours of uh, October 25th of 2011, that police are hearing from family members that the only person who had any, any animus towards Garrett was Nick Hillary. Um, so that's why they initially, and of course, this is investigation 101, all right? So you're gonna look at immediate family members. Nick was had been living with Garrett and his mom and, and Garrett's half-brother, Aaron, for uh, 10 uh, months out of the 12 months preceding this homicide. It was only a couple months earlier. His mom, uh, Tandy Cyrus, breaks up with Nick at the request, if you will, of her two children who are like, this is not working out. So, you know, investigation 101, you're going to look at close family members. And by the way, Mr. Hillary testified under oath to me and to questioning by his own lawyer back golly, is back in 2014 when he, when I did a seven hour video deposition that he, Mr. Hillary, felt it was fair for the police to be questioning him on the 26th of October, 2011, precisely because he was the ex-boyfriend, the most recent ex-boyfriend of the mother of this child. His own words. So you mentioned those two kids who had to give up their socks. Do they have a lawsuit against the Potsdam police? And no, not at all. The no, they, their parents uh, were <laughs> fine. You know, you know, come meet our kids, interview them, find out what they were doing, uh, look at their feet, look at their arms, take off your socks and shoes, you know, checking because they, you know, again, the police had a, had a reasonable suspicion that somebody went out the back window and they very well may have been injured because it's a two story uh, drop to get down there. So we think somebody might have a lower leg injury that had escaped from this uh, apartment building. So what I want my audience to understand is this is an unusual case. The civil suit was started before the criminal Correct. case. Okay. So Nick Hillary was acquitted. However, you believe Nick Hillary is responsible for Garrett Phillips' murder. What do you think the most clear and convincing evidence against him is? 
So there's a constellation of evidence that was against Nick, and, it, and, it, and I'll try to go through as much of it as I can in as brief a period of time as I can. So first of all, Nick is the only person in all of this investigation that had motive. He had means, he had opportunity, he'd had a key to the apartment. He's the only person who was deceptive. He lied to the police on the night of the murder. They didn't know he was lying at the time. Um, he lies to the police at the time of his interview. He is the only person who was investigated. All of her ex-boyfriends of the recent years were all looked at. They all gave DNA, they gave fingerprints, they gave statements. He's the only one who refused to cooperate. He actually had a right ankle injury, a swollen ankle with an abrasion, laceration on the outside of his ankle, consistent with someone, of course, escaping this window. Putting all those things aside for a moment, we know from the you know criminal trial and from my depositions of him, he's seen on the Potsdam High School security camera video, essentially following Garrett out of the high, high school parking lot and going home, turning in the opposite direction of where his apartment was, north on Leroy Street, instead he turns south. And that car does some unusual things in that parking lot that, again, back at the beginning days of this investigation, the pe police didn't know who that was in that vehicle because, you know, it's not CSI, you can't zoom in up, oh, that's Roberta behind the wheel, oh, I can see her. It doesn't work that way in real life, unfortunately. Um, so there were all of those issues, and then, you know, he was, they, people were able to place him in the vicinity of the apartment. And, and most importantly, and again, you know, this, there's been, uh, I don't know, umpteen programs about this case over the years, but ultimately, you know, there was DNA found under Garrett's fingernail that was consistent with Mr. Hillary's DNA. Uh, for technical reasons, the judge kept it out of the criminal trial, but that doesn't change the fact that it exists and it was consistent with Mr. Hillary's DNA. And that's the nail in the coffin, always, in my opinion. That put him in the room with Garrett, the guy who had means, motive, opportunity, seen in the area, deceptive to the police, and DNA that's nine out of 15 alleles matched Mr. Hillary and no one else are found under this kid's fingernails. You tell me. And so, But the judge threw that DNA out, correct? So here's what happened. Yeah, so in the civil trial, uh, the defense, a uh, uh, very clever argument that they made, Two things, um, when you're looking at DNA sampling, okay, back in the technology at the time, and Mr. Hillary, by the way, is the beneficiary of the fact that the criminal genetic de genealogy type of research really wasn't a thing so much back then. Um, but in any event, there was a mixed sample of genetic material under Garrett's fingernail. 95% of it, let's say, was Garrett's DNA, which much like if I took a scraping from your fingernail, it's almost all going to be yours. 5% of it was an unknown male donor, okay? And of the 15 alleles that you extrapolate out from DNA, nine of them matched Nick Hillary and no one else in the investigation, by the way. Um, however, under the uh, guidelines, if you will, of the state police forensics lab, that's not enough to say that's the guy, okay? You need 15. However, there's other things that have been done in technology over the years, and one of which was something called StarMix, which is a company out of New Zealand. And StarMix would take these mixed samples and compare them to genetic databases and basically come up with a, a probability of, you know, what are the chances it's anyone other than this person who matches nine of these alleles? And it was like 33 million to one. So the defense moved to keep out StarMix. And the judge actually said, no, Starmix is good science. That's fine. That's coming in. But the defense also made an argument that the data that the state police crime lab have that you then compare, that Starmix gets from them to compare, if you will, the uh, sample, that wasn't validated properly. Uh, it had been validated by other labs, but not, as I recall, the state police. So the defense argument was, well, wait a second, even if star mix is good science, the data under which that or the data that they compared it to wasn't properly validated. So you can't use the, the science and that argument the judge bought and, and having done a lot of lab defense work over the years and very familiar with lab validation studies, they pulled the wool over his eyes quite effectively. Um, but he fell for it. He bought it, whatever you want to call it. He found in their favor and, uh, and therefore he said, oh, well, we got to keep the star mix out. So then it was purely a, uh, a circumstantial case. And one other thing I left out from earlier, Roberta, was, you know, his, his prime alibi witness was his daughter, Janike. 
who claims that I'm, you know, home with dad from five to five fifteen, which was the the pertinent period of time on the afternoon, early evening of October 26, 2011. Well, only one person, other than Garrett, who can't talk because he's dead, would know that's the pertinent time frame to focus on for that day because it was not public knowledge for a long time when the assault took place, when Garrett died, et cetera. However, Mr. Hillary's best friend and lawyer buddy is up there two days after the murder coaching Shanna Kay about that very 15 minute period of time, which was impossible for him to know that was the period of time to focus on at that time because that wasn't public. So you tell me where he got that information from to and, have his daughter to be saying, dad's home then. And, and, and we were able to prove that she was almost assuredly lying. But in any event, go ahead, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, what, what, didn't um, Nick Hillary make calls to his friend? You're talking about Manny Trafari, who's right. representing him in this civil suit that we're about to right. talk about. Um, so didn't he make calls after Garrett's uh, murder to, were the calls directly yeah. to Manny? There were, and and I I haven't looked at the call registry in in a little while, but I, if I recall correctly, I think the first phone call he made when his phone came back on, it had been off for a couple of hours off the grid, was to Manny, you know, whose real name is Howard Beckford or Beckwith, you know, he's he's not who he says he is, but he changed his name, so God bless him, and then more importantly, and and Mr. Hillary admitted to this during the civil trial that just went on this week was. That evening, after the police call him to say, hey, we'd like to come talk to you because they're making what's called a death notification to essentially a next of kin. Um, they don't, they're reaching out to Nick strictly because we know he had a relationship with mom and we wanna let him know and maybe he has information. The police have at that point, no reason to know anything about Nick, right? But in any event, so in between Mark Murray calling him at his home, or it's really his cell phone, he's frantically reaching out to Nick Hillary, excuse me, to Manai Tafari by phone, by two different phone numbers. And, and when we get to it, I can tell you a kind of funny uh, story from the trial when Nick was confronted with his own cell phone contact list, where he's trying to deny which, Tafari had two phone numbers in Nick's phone. I'll talk about it right now. Sure. He tried to say, I only called him four times, not eight, as you claim, Mr. Defense Attorney. Greg Johnson, who's a very fine lawyer and doing a good job. And he pulls out his contacts list from his own cell phone and says, wouldn't you recognize his phone number from your own contact list downloaded from your phone? Uh, probably. And I, oh, I don't know. I don't know how that number got in there. You know, it was, it was <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, the guy lies about the littlest things constantly and has been since the night of the 24th of October 2011, as it turns out. Uh, he, I mean, he said it's the most amazing deposition. The two depositions you did are some of the most incredible depositions just from a lawyering standpoint and, and um, just unbelievable whoppers of, of, of lies. He said he had a great relationship with Tandy, uh, with with Garrett. He no. couldn't remember who broke up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> whether he broke up. I mean, to me, that's really stood out. I mean, I'm you just know. remembering off the top of my head. But it's there. They're just really incredible um, lawyering, incredible depositions. So who is, who are both, you mentioned Mr. Johnson, right. who for the defense, who's representing, is this just the Potsdam police or is it the town of Potsdam? Who is being, who is? Uh, so it's, it's actually the village. It's actually the village. village. Thank you. So, so Greg took over my defense. It was, it's for the village of Potsdam and uh, the former chief, Ed Tischler, and uh, now chief, former Lieutenant uh, Mark Murray. There was another gentleman who's the now Lieutenant, uh, he was uh, Sergeant Mike Ames. He was dropped from the case last week and rightfully so. Um, but it basically it's, it's Ed Tischler, former chief, Mark Murray, the then detective, now current chief, and the village who of course is their employer. So why, if you're Nick Hillary, um, how do you, how does, how does, how, okay, and who, oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Who is, so we have uh, Manny Trafari and who's the other lawyer representing okay. yeah, so, uh, Nick um, Hillary? 
So Manny Tafari has handled this since the inception back in the uh, very beginning of 2012. And about a week or two before trial, there was a notice of appearance filed by an attorney named Brett Klein from down in uh, New York City um, to be uh, assisting. Or And he, Mr. Klein has been trial counsel. He's done everything on behalf of the plaintiffs in this trial. Um, Mr. Tafari has basically been his, what, what we would refer to as a second chair. You're there, you're silent, but you're an assistant. Um, and of course, Mr. Hillary sitting to uh, the other side of the council's table. And so just that uh, Brett Klein also represented uh, Eric Gardner, uh, as, as, I guess the late Eric Gardner was, I believe that's uh, correct. Su yeah. was suffocated um, <clears throat> by the police selling Lucy cigarettes. It's a very notorious case, at least in yeah. New York. Yes. Um, so, um, so when, if you're Nick Hillary, how, how do you prove that your Fourth Amendment right, which has to do with search and seizure, your Fifth Amendment right, which has to do with um, being detained, and your Sixth Amendment right, um, how, do, how do you, how do you, uh, I don't even understand how the Sixth Amendment sure. was violated well, in this. Well, first and foremost, if I'm Nick Hillary, I don't sleep at night because of what I did, in my True. opinion. However, so actually there were a whole bunch of claims that Mr. Hillary made in his initial 2012 lawsuit. Uh, at the conclusion of discovery, I moved for summary judgment and I got about 90% of them dismissed years ago. And I think that was 2014, March of 2014, March 31, 2014, I believe the decision was handed down by Judge Sharp. His second lawsuit that he filed after the criminal trial all of those claims have been dismissed by Judge Sharp. The only claim that uh, the only defendant who didn't move to dismiss the complaint in one form or another was uh, Bill Fitzpatrick, uh, who was uh, he's the DA in Onondaga County, Syracuse, New York. Um, they basically they dropped the claim against him in the end. Um, in any event, so all that was left actually is. There were two portions of uh, Fourth Amendment violations, an unlawful detention beginning at 9.38 a.m. on October 26, 2011. That lasted until a uh, search warrant is signed for his person at 3.46, 3.47 p.m. Um, and then secondly, uh, as of before the trial began, he also had a claim that the police unlawfully seized his cell phone from him. That claim was dismissed at the close of this trial because, again, Mr. Hillary only in this action, he only sued the village of Potsdam and their police, okay? He never sued anybody from the sheriff's department. He never sued the state police who were intimately involved. It was the state police investigator who actually took his cell phone and seized it. So that's why that claim got tossed out during the trial. You could see it on video. Um, so again, the only claim that was left really actually the only thing left for this jury to decide is whether or not um, his detention um, at 9.38 a.m. on October 26, 2011 for approximately six hours was lawful or not. We know it was warrantless, but there are exceptions to the requirement that you have a warrant to seize and detain and search somebody. Uh, they didn't search him until after they got a warrant, by the way. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's it. That's all that's left. And there's, there's a, we can talk about the different exceptions and how you go about, um, uh, defending yourself from that. But that's his claim. That's all that's left. Every other claim he has ever made has been ruled on by judges and dismissed. So how has the trial gone in your view? Who were the, who were the witnesses that were really effective? Who, sure. I mean, who, who I mean, What's happened? What's what's going on? Well, um, there weren't a lot of witnesses. It's it, the trial was done and all the proof jury selection uh, was done Monday morning. Opening arguments began on Monday afternoon. And the first witness was Ed Tischler, now retired former chief. Um, after Ed was uh, was Mark Murray, current chief lieutenant. Um, at one point, um, uh, Tandy Cyrus was called out of order. She was subpoenaed by the defense to testify not by the plaintiff, but because she had traveled a long way and was waiting, they put her on the stand to briefly do her testimony. They finished then Mark Murray um, and then Nick Hillary uh, testified for the plaintiff's case, <clears throat> excuse me. And 
The only other witnesses that were called in the case, uh, Gary Snell is a retired state police BCI investigator who was involved in questioning Mr. Hillary and was the one who very clearly on camera says to Mr. Hillary, right after Mark Murray says, you can leave, he says, no, 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 you ain't leaving. We're detaining you to go get a warrant to search yourself, search your person, excuse me. Um, and then last, only other witness was Ian Fairley, the former assistant coach uh, at the Clarkson um, for the Clarkson men's soccer team. He was a fairly brief uh, final witness in the case. That's it. There were no other witnesses. There was a whole heck of a lot of um, documentary evidence. There were videos from the security camera footage from Lieutenant Murray's office um, that had a, a video system in there to record, you know, whenever you're in there questioning. So there's audio and video from that. And um and then a whole slew of documents, uh, lead sheets, the warrant application, the supporting depositions, crime scene photos. I mean, there's probably hundreds of pages of documentary evidence. So does this feel like in some ways a criminal trial? Are they going over the reasons why they suspected Nick Hillary? I mean, are they going over that stuff? Or, I mean, so is it intimately connected with, with the, what he was criminally charged with? So it is and it isn't. So I know that's kind of a lawyerly answer, but I'll explain why. So Judge Sharp made it very clear to this jury and to the attorneys that we are not trying a murder case over again. What we are going to determine is, did the police have a reasonable basis to suspect that Nick Hillary may have been involved in this homicide? Not that proving that he was or wasn't for that matter, but he may have been involved and he may have had evidence on his person or somewhere else if he was allowed to leave so that it was reasonable for them to detain him, seize him, if you will, at 9.38 a.m. on October 26, 2011, while they were securing this search warrant and doing all the things that they needed to do to secure the search warrant. And again, this kind of gets into some of the exceptions to the warrantless detention, um, because typically you can't do that without a warrant. Uh, but basically, did they have probable cause? Did they have arguable probable cause? and or were there um, exigent circumstances that required them to detain him while they were diligently applying for the search warrant to make sure that evidence didn't get disposed of or destroyed. So they are intertwined, but the judge made it very clear, um, uh, especially to Mr. Klein that, you know, this isn't a murder trial. We're not going, anything having to do with police tactics, not an issue. You can't, we're not here to criticize, did they do a good investigation or not? That wasn't the issue. Um, as well, <clears throat> excuse me, anything that like he, anything, if you were trying to claim that his Miranda rights were, uh, um, uh, improperly given or stomp, uh, trampled upon, not an issue in this case, you know, the, the, Mr. Klein tried to insinuate to the jury several times that, you know, the, uh, police lied to, to Nick as a ruse, you know, to try to get him to say something. And the judge made it very clear to the jury and to Mr. Klein several times that, they're allowed to do that under the law and to suggest otherwise is actually not correct. So anyway, um, so it's, it's an interesting, even the judge was, you know, uh, saying, is it an interesting situation where it's not a murder trial, but it's all about a murder. And it's very, you know, the fact that Garrett it was a homicide, they were investigating a homicide. All of that was, you know, clearly part of this case, but we we're looking at this very narrow window of, of basically not even the first 48 hours, not even. It was really, you know, from roughly 5 p.m. on October 24, 2011 to 20 to 10 on October 26, 2011. A very small window of time of what did the police know and, uh, you know, did they have a reasonable basis to detain this guy to get that warrant that ultimately got signed by a judge. Is, so the warrant was approved. Is Nick Hillary asking for a certain amount of money? <clears throat> so, uh Interesting thing happened last week uh, before the trial. Um, Mr. Hillary's team tried to claim that there were far more claims still viable left in his complaint than were actually pled. And the judge basically said, no, they aren't. This is very limited. We dismissed all those other things. You didn't plead these other things you're claiming. And what we're going to do actually to simplify this, if you will, for the jury is we're going to bifurcate this trial, which means we're going to try liability issues only first. And if there's a finding in favor of the defense, everybody goes home. Um, if there's a finding in favor of the plaintiff, then they have a damages trial. So the jury isn't even being asked to consider damages. There's been no 
testimony about damages. There's been no amount asked for anything like that. And, and um, you mentioned uh, Mr. Klein has come, uh, has <laughs> clashed with this Judge Sharp. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And, you know, look, there's uh, even the judge kind of jokingly said in his charge today, and when he talked about how, look, there were interactions with me and counsel, and you're not to read into that, you know, I'm a commergeny old uh, judge. <laughs> to you, basically. However, I will say in 31 years of doing this, I have never in my life seen the number of times that an attorney was reprimanded and or scolded first, uh, you know, a number of times outside and on Monday, the judge at one point to sent the jury out and, and told uh, you know, Mr. Klein, basically, knock it off. I know what you're doing. And if you keep doing it, I'm going to embarrass you in front of this jury. And then he did embarrass him in front of that jury and several times over the next few days. Because How so? How so? So, for example, um, he was trying to get a piece of evidence in a video um, and he wasn't doing it the correct way. So, so it has to do with a video taken by the state police of Mr. Hillary at a soccer game the night of October 25th, 2011. There's a way to get that in evidence. You subpoena the state police. They took the video. They didn't do that. They didn't bother to do that. So anyway, you can't get it in through these other way, ways in which he kept trying. And at one point, the judge got so fed up with him asking all of these other witnesses who cannot lay an evidentiary foundation for this thing. Are you familiar with the rules of evidence as they are list, you know, uh, listed under the federal <laughs> rules of evidence? And at one point, I, I, you know, I actually felt bad for the guy. The judge literally said, have you ever been in a courtroom before today? <laughs> on Tuesday afternoon, I mean, that in front of the jury. So that, you know, you know, the judge is, is frustrated at that point. Um, and, you know, it, it, that was painful as an attorney. You know, um, listen, we've all had our times. We've, we've stumbled on things that are here and there. But uh, he kept doing a lot of the same things over and over and over again, which, you know, got the judge frustrated, it, you know, like keep stepping on the rake. It's going to hit you in the head every time. So anyway. <laughs> right. So what did Tandy Cyrus, what was her testimony? What did, what was, what did that consist of? So her testimony was very brief. Um, and, and the tension by the way, in that courtroom was very palpable. Tandy was on edge. Clearly she, um, could not look at Mr. Hillary, would not look at Mr. Hillary, and, and rightfully so. She was only put on the stand to establish a couple of things, really. Um, and one of the primary things had to do with the fact that uh, in September, approximately mid-September of 2011, after she's moved out with her boys to this Market Street apartment, um, while Nick Hillary still has a key, she's broken up with him, told him, I need my space. He shows up uninvited at her apartment at midnight, and not just at her apartment, not like knock, knock on the front door. She's in bed in her bedroom and awakens to see Nick standing there. And this was a critical thing for the police because when they saw Nick or spoke to him on the night of the 24th at his apartment as part of this death notification, said, you know, Hey, when's the last time you had any contact with Tandy over the last couple months since you moved out or you both you know, moved to separate places? Nope. Have you ever been in that apartment since you helped move them in in August? Nope. And then they come to find out 24 hours later or less, that was a lie. And he was being deceptive from the initial conversation they had with him, among other things. So that was perhaps the key thing. I think her testimony, honestly, Roberta, was maybe 15 minutes. Wow. Very it was brilliant. pretty brief. Because for, so they or the jury had already seen the security camera video footage of her interview in the Potsdam police station from the 25th of October 2011. Um, although the audio quality on it was exceedingly poor, uh, in part because she was so soft spoken. I mean, here she was, her son had been murdered um, and she's distraught. You really could hardly hear her. And that was another thing. Like, you know, if you're going to make this, that was put on by the plaintiff. Um, it's an hour, I don't know how long, longer than that maybe. And he would play parts of it 
And the jurors, 30 seconds in, Roberta, the jurors, three of them raised their hands and said, we can't hear anything. Mr. Were, Klein, they, were they given headphones or, an, or any kind of no, transcript this, or anything? Nope, there is none. There's just the raw audio video. And, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you spend the money on an AV company to, um, you know, clean it up, if you will, to make it wherever you can hear it. You know, I was able to do it on my own computer in my office years ago. So anybody could have done it. But so what, what happened was, you know, they get to see this, but Mr. Klein would play five or 10 minutes of it and then turn to the chief who was on the stand for, I think this part of the term, maybe it was Mark Murray and say, uh, so basically what did you guys talk about in those 10 minutes? It's like, <laughs> it was, it, it was uh, Ed Tischler actually. And, and there are times he's like, I don't know. I couldn't hear it either. And I don't remember everything that was said. There's no transcript of this. So anyway, um, it was, it so, is what it is. And you mentioned Nick Hillary took this stand. Yes. And I was looking over at some of the comments of our previous um, interview. It's in the, the link is in the comment, in the comment, uh, in the description. Okay. But I was looking at the comments and people were talking about Nick Hillary in the um in the um documentary and saying oh he's so charming um I, I can see he really got over on the on the audience do you think that he got over on the jury well that depends on uh which part of his testimony you saw so on direct examination first of all it's it's scripted it was, he of course answered all the questions uh, correctly. He was as charming as could be. But in my opinion, the real Nick came out on cross-examination when he was confronted with lies and he got very aggravated, very, very frustrated. The, the, the true Nick, he showed his fangs on cross-examination, getting angry and uh, cornered as you could see. And there were a number of times on cross-examination that Greg did an excellent job uh, pulling things out. And, uh, and there were things, for example, you know, pulling out his transcripts from my depositions of him where he's trying to claim now, again, that he didn't have an ankle injury. You know, so for example, on the 25th, excuse me, 26th, at one point when he's being interviewed by Mark Murray and uh, Gary Snell from the state police, Mark from Potsdam PD, Mark says, you know, do you have an injury to your, to your, right leg or your ankle? No, I didn't. So Greg asked him, that was a lie when you told him that. No, it wasn't. And then he has to pull out the transcript where Nick admits under oath years ago that, yeah, in fact, I had a right ankle injury. It was swollen. I had sprained it. I had a laceration and abrasion on it, which he claimed had occurred a week before the murder when he was moving furniture in his apartment. That was all he could recall as to how years ago, that's all he could recall as to how he'd injured this ankle allegedly. So, but he tried to claim that that wasn't a lie when he said I didn't have an ankle injury uh, and essentially tried to cover that up from the police way back when, when it turned out he did have an ankle injury. The only individual who was investigated in the entirety of this case who had an ankle injury which would be consistent with jumping out a second story window. So is there anything else I missed? I mean, which way do you think the jury's going to go? Well, look, it's, you know, predicting what juries can do or are going to do, even when you've lived a case or been the trial attorney is a difficult thing. I've had, uh, you know, juries had the case uh, since about noon today. Um, they had lunch delivered, so they deliberated probably for the better part of four, four and a half hours before the judge sent them home, just around five, because um, they had some other obligations this evening. Um, and they're coming back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to resume. Um, I've had cases over the years, juries deliberated 15 minutes, and I won. I had juries deliberate three days, and I won. And all manner of in-between. Um, so... I don't know what the jury's going to do. I would like to think they'll do the, the right thing. Um, they will find that this was a, um, uh, these were exceptions to the warrantless search uh, rules that the police acted in with uh, reasonableness and objectively reasonable for what they knew at the time um, to detain him uh, to get that search warrant that they, they wanted to get. So I guess I have a, one more question, which is, sure. I mean, I have a couple more questions, but do you think... Do you think that there's a long time for this? Do you think that in the 
defund the police, Black Lives Matter a couple of years ago, that this would be a slam dunk case? You know, that's a good question. And certainly as well, that's some of the things that uh, get dealt with in jury selection. So, um, for example, there was a juror, prospective juror who got up and said, oh, I saw the HBO video and what they did to that guy was terrible. She, of course, was dismissed. There was another, there was another guy who, who also, I think he'd seen that documentary or whatever. And uh, a funny thing was he gets dismissed. He says, I can't be fair. And on his way out, he, with, with his back to the judge, he very slyly flipped Mark Murray off as he's walking out of the courtroom. I'm like, really? You know, um, so... You know, you'd like to think all those things are dealt with by the judge and the parties or the attorneys and jury selection. In federal court, the judges do, you know, 99% of the jury selection. Um, the, the attorneys get to do very little. Um, the, the nine people, and it has to be unanimous in federal court, the nine jurors that were selected all said, you know, yeah, I can be fair. I'm not biased, all these other things. So, you know, who knows? And and they're, they're range in various ages. Um, uh, I think the youngest juror appears to be probably in her late twenties and the oldest, uh, maybe in her around 60 at best. Um, and it's, I think it's, well, there's nine of them, so it can't be a 50, 50 split, but I think it's one, two, three, I think it's five women, four men, if I recall correctly. And, you know, I was, I was surprised by the press on this. I mean, everything, the, uh, everything, all the press I've ever seen about this case is very pro Nick Hillary. Um, yeah. Yeah, Why well, do you think that is? Oh, boy. Uh, you know what? I would like to think that uh, the members of uh, our mainstream media or whatever you want to call it would be more objective and report the facts. I've read a couple of the articles that were in our local paper, uh, some of the North Country stuff, and um, you would think they were reporting on a different trial. I mean, it was as if there was one article. It was as if Nick they had missed all of Nick's cross-examination, apparently. Um, so, you know, uh, Nick's side has since almost the beginning had a well oiled and funded, uh, PR, uh, team, if you will, back there to try to feed things to the press. And, um, um, you know, they had a front page New York times, Sunday times article back in March of 2016. Um, I reached out to the author of that article afterwards and very diplomatically said, you know, but for like the dates, some punctuation <laughs> and a the and an uh, you got a lot of stuff wrong and you knew who I was. You never bothered to reach out to me or my side to try to get some objective, you know, viewpoint here and, and to go through the facts as they are known and as, as we saw them. So, um, you know, I can't control that. And, um, you know, I met that guy, uh, during the criminal trial, we, had a very pleasant conversation and agreed to disagree. And, you know, he has an agenda that, and a lot of other people had agendas that simply did not exist, especially when it came to, you know, this was all about race when Mr. Hillary never even made a race-based claim and was the guy who again said, yeah, it was fair for them to be questioning me. You know. And, and, and uh, the documentary has so cemented this myth that this is a racist town and... <laughs> Yeah, this, I mean, the, and and they like to blame it on uh, Jones. The was it, John some Jones. Kind of, John Talk, Jones wasn't he a sheriff or a? John is still a sheriff's deputy sheriff. up in St. Lawrence County. He was an ex-boyfriend of Tandy's. In fact, he was her boyfriend before Tandy meets Nick, um, and uh, and that was definitely a friction. Uh, there was a lot of friction in that breakup. John was upset. He was upset with Nick, et cetera. But that was a year before um, Garrett's murder. And, you know, they, the, this Mr. Hillary's team, shall we say, has been pointing the finger and his supporters that it had to be John Jones. It had to be John Jones. His DNA didn't match. He's on, I believe, four, if not five different video cameras walking his dog at the exact time <laughs> of the murder. I mean, and he had no motive. Garrett loved John. Tandy testified to that years ago. And uh, um, they had a great relationship. So, you know, for all these people, uh, hopefully, you know, they're listening or maybe they're not. But 
It wasn't John Jones and it never was going to be John Jones. And if anybody has a lawsuit or could have filed a lawsuit for defamation, it was John Jones. And, uh, you know, he chose to, to not do that. And I respect his decision for that. So if Nick Hillary loses this trial, will this change the myth? I mean, is there anything that they could change this myth that, that yeah, this is a racist? I mean, does this, will this jury verdict have any, any bearing on this myth? No, American myth? So, no. you know, regardless of the outcome, uh, so what are the outcomes? Nick could lose and Nick's side will say it was a biased jury and they're racist or whatever. Nick could win and the jury could award him little or nothing and he'll say, yeah, it was a biased jury. They're stupid or something like that. Or he could win and they, they award him money and then he'll say, I was vindicated all along. And uh, But again, this case and this trial has nothing to do with race. The judge even told the jury this quite clearly. He asked them questions about, hey, if you have any issues when it comes to racial animus or whatever, this isn't the case for you because this has nothing to do with this case. Um, anyway, but nothing will ever change. Nothing will ever change the people who have, you know, same with the people who decided, oh, it had to be John Jones. Despite the fact that a guy's on video at the time of the murder doing something else. I mean, and you pointed out he would have to have brought his dog. Yeah. I mean, he's I mean, got this, you know, kind of uh, slightly overweight Labrador retriever. And and, uh, and even John would tell you that he wasn't in the greatest shape of his life back then, maybe. Um, but, uh, out of second story. you know, you're going to bring your dog to. Oh, by the way, speaking of jumping out the second story window, Mr. Klein, during his closing argument, tried to make this argument that, in fact, the perpetrator went out the front door. Yeah. So basically, uh, Marissa Vogel, the next door neighbor, knocks on the door. She calls the police. There's a brief period of time where she goes back in her apartment and closes the door. The door that had been locked, that she heard the deadbolt turn. You can only lock from the inside because it's a it's a twist deadbolt. Um, so tried to make the argument that the killer went out the front door. Forget what you saw at the window with the screen pushed out. Well, here's the idiocy, the lunacy of that argument. The door was locked from the inside. And the only way you could lock it from the outside is if you had a freaking key to the apartment. This was clearly a targeted crime. Nothing was taken. There was no robbery. There was no sexual assault. This was somebody who wanted to target this kid. And only one person ever, other than Nick, excuse me, other than Tandy and Garrett had a key to that apartment and had made keys. Oh, by the way, and Hold on, let me finish. And that was Nick. They showed Nick the receipt from the Ace Hardware store from August. First, he claimed, I only had two keys made. Here's the receipt that says, Mr. Hillary, thank you for your business, which shows three keys. He tried to claim that was wrong. And they showed him the credit card receipt from it where he said he didn't recognize his own signature. I mean, Greg even asked him, was there somebody else using your credit card at or about that time at that Ace Hardware having keys to that apartment made other than maybe you? I mean, again, the guy lies about so many little things. It, it, is, it blows my mind. I mean, it's not, it, that is a remarkable and that stood out. It, it, I think he said, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna say 500 times would be an exaggeration, but maybe not 150 times in the deposition with you. Mm -hmm. but. He also, when in these interviews, I was looking at an interview with Liz Garbus, um, who, by, <laughs> who, by the way, uh, HBO pitched her to come on and talk about, she didn't want to come on this program, <laughs> surprisingly. In fact, canceled her entire uh, tour for uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Didn't want to do it. I don't know if it had to do with this or something else, but interesting i was dying to talk about this this document the documentary she made about this case and, and many others anyway so what's interesting is in those interviews he never talks if he had such a great relationship with garrett phillips he never talks about garrett phillips it's only about himself and what's happened to him not that he lost this great person in his life not that he was murdered not that he has to find the murderer None right. of that. It's no. always, it's, it's like it's Garrett doesn't normal. exist and he's the victim. Exactly. And a very interesting thing that happened during his direct examination, Nick's direct examination by his lawyer, Nick studiously avoided ever referring to Garrett by his name. 
he would not say his name. He referred to him as the boy or Tandy's son. He never said this kid's name ever. And I thought that was chilling. I thought it was an interesting psychological tell. Um, I just, it stood out to me, uh, you know, so totally. And, and, you know, you were talking about the, you know, the relationship and, um, you know, Nick Hillary was the only person who claimed that he and Garrett had a good relationship, that the breakup with Tandy was this civil, you know, everything was fine. Every single other person, all her family members, friends, people that were deposed, you name it, et cetera. Everybody said, no, Nick and Garrett did not like each other. And Tandy and Nick's relationship, the breakup was not this, you know, wonderful. Yeah, he helped move her out of the apartment. Um, great for him. What a chivalrous guy. But, you know, anyway, or excuse me, move her out of the house that they cohabitated in for about 10 months. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's amazing because Nick, to believe Nick's version, everybody, everybody else lied. Every single person lied except Nick to believe his version. It, it, this has the, been the most amazing. After uh, the interview I did with you, mm -hmm. uh, I heard from, I've never heard from so many people who knew Garrett. Uh, it's unlike any other podcast I've made. Mm -hmm. This kid, it, it was 12 years old, Garrett Phillips, so loved, uh, amazingly loved his fourth grade mm -hmm. teacher. So many people wanted to get in touch with me, and it was really unusual. And this case touches me in a way um, it's hard to let go of. So I, I understand why you were at this trial. And yeah, I wasn't uh, going to miss it for the world, Robert. I mean, I, um, you know, Garrett never met him. Obviously, he had a huge impact on my life, and uh, my involvement in in his case, you know, directly led to you know, where I am in the, the firm I'm at now and uh, some of the good things that I already had a successful career already. Don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, so I mentioned this to you before and I visit his grave every time I'm back in Potsdam, every single time because I have a debt that I owe to that kid. Um, and I, you know, certainly feel uh, in terrible for his family. Um, but one person I will never, ever, ever feel terrible for is, is Nick. Um, and, you know, one other thing that we didn't really touch on that, um, uh, just going to Nick and his deceptiveness, et cetera, and why the police started really thinking, hey, wait a second, we need to look at this guy closer was when the police arrived to give the death notification to, to Nick, um, first of all, Garrett's dead and he acts completely surprised, Okay. Never, ever at any time does he ask anybody at any of the times, by the way, that he was told Garrett was dead. Does he ask the question, oh, my God, what happened? You know, this was a father figure in Garrett's life. But the police, when they went to his apartment that night, and again, they weren't going there to interrogate him. They were there for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. They did not know that a guy named Jeff Chains had called Nick around five of eight, a guy that knew Nick and knew his relationship with Tandy previously and said, you might want to sit down. Something happened to Garrett. I heard he's dead. Does Nick bother to share this with the police at two hours or an hour and a half later when they show up his apartment? No, he pretends as if he didn't know a thing. And by the way, he even testified to me under oath at both depositions. When Jeff James called, at first he said, all he told me was something happened to Garrett. Oh, okay. He didn't say he was dead. No, no, no. All right. So he calls you and says, something happened to Garrett. You might want to sit down. Yep. Did you ask him any questions? No. Were you curious? No. You loved Garrett? You, you cared for him? Yep. But you didn't ask a single question when Jeff James calls you, when Mark Murray calls at 9.24 p.m. and says, we'd like to come over and speak to you. Something happened to Tandy's 10-year-old son. He says, sure. He doesn't stop and say, wait a minute, what do you mean something happened? Wait, 10-year-old? She doesn't have a 10-year-old son. She has a 12-year-old and a 7-year-old. Mm -hmm. When the police get there, what happened? When the police then question him the next time on the 26th, never does he ask a single question. And he only gets upset and frustrated when the attention turns to, where were you on the night of the murder type thing? And it's, oh, I'm, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm, I, uh, I need to leave. So... I digress. It's, Sorry. It's un unreal. So do you think we'll get a verdict? Uh, we can't, you can't predict, but um, possibly a verdict tomorrow. Uh, I do. I mean, I, I believe the judge was only going to, uh, because some other uh, 
commitments. I believe they were only going to be allowed to deliberate until 2 p.m., but that's, you know, 9 a.m. to, uh, what, five hours they'll get to uh, deliberate, I think. You know, that's uh, not an unreasonable amount of time. There's a lot of stuff to sift through. The jury actually came back and asked for three things to be played back to them. One was a phone call from the morning, I believe, of the 26th of October 2011 between Mark Murray and uh, former St. Lawrence County uh, DA investigator Dan Manor. They asked for five minutes of the interview with Tandy from the 25th to be played back. And then they asked for this roughly 15 minute segment of the interview from uh, Mark Murray's office of Nick Hillary, Mark Murray and Gary Snell, where, which leads up to Nick refusing to answer any more questions and wanting to leave. And he says to um, Mark, you know, can I leave? And Mark says, yeah, go ahead. And he gets up to go and Gary Snell stands up and says, you're not going anywhere. You're being detained. We're getting a warrant. Um, so, and the, the thing that, so, you know, so you were allowed to detain, but, but he didn't have a warrant, but right. there are circumstances you're allowed to detain someone. In Absolutely. There, there are exceptions mm -hmm. to, to the, uh, to the rule, if you will, that you can detain somebody, um, if you have probable cause, you have arguable probable cause, you have exigent right. circumstances, you think somebody might destroy evidence or otherwise do something to get rid of evidence. And you're diligently pursuing a warrant, which, in fact, the first thing Mark Murray did after he walks out of that office is he sat down at the computer and started putting together the 36 page warrant application that took several hours to get done and then signed. But um, in any event, uh, those were all the reasons. And, and, you know, not for nothing, but it's clear on the video that it was is, and not. And Gary made the right decision, in my opinion, and even in the police uh, Pete Potsdam's uh, opinion, I think, to detain Nick. But that decision was made by Gary Snell, uh, who did the right thing and said, you're not going anywhere, buddy, um, and explain to him why. So um, anyway, but that's, that's what this case is all about now, just this, this, this uh, detention of Mr. Hillary for about six hours while they were getting the warrant to search his person. So, And then, of course, when they did search him, which isn't even part of the case anymore, they come to find out that, in fact, yes, he did have an ankle injury, which was consistent with somebody possibly jumping out that second story window so anyway. it's very much like oj the finger <laughs> those injuries those those injuries are always the red flags for yeah. me and roberta um, i always said this was the oj case backwards you know oj they did a criminal case then they did the civil case and in our case you know we did a civil case and in fact the only reason the only reason there was ever a criminal case was because nick hillary at the insistence of his attorney friend, Manny Howie Tafari, um, <laughs> you know, says, we're going to file a lawsuit against the police. And Nick testifies under oath. And I know from having spoken with the district attorneys, um, various other people, they, they had then nothing. I mean, they, they the, the security camera footage that it was with what they thought was his car, they didn't know it was his car. He put himself in that car. See, they would never have ever indicted this guy without him opening his mouth with his lawyer sitting next to him under oath for a combined total of about 12 hours of me questioning him. It never would have happened and we wouldn't be talking. You and I would never have met. <laughs> uh, well, I'm so glad you came on. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting that that there's no dialogue about this, you know, nobody wants to, from the other side wants to have a dialogue about this case. I think you said at the end of uh, our last episode, if anybody wants, I'll go through the facts of this. Any, anybody wants, I'll go from A to Z with anybody who wants to talk yeah. to me about it. And it seems to be a real difference. It's like radio silence from the Nick Hillary supporters. Yeah. A lot of insults, oh, <laughs> a yeah. lot of insults, you, but just uh, radio silence as far that. as, as far as, uh, I get the random, uh, random, you know, threatening email every so often. Right. Um, you know, I've even gotten emails from Manai Tafari's wife over the years. Uh, I ignored them all, I think. Uh, um, but uh, whatever. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of people, and I've many, many times, both through this forum and uh, a couple of the times, said, I'd "Be happy to talk to you, anybody, anywhere. I'll be happy to go through all the evidence. I'll show it to you if I can, and explain to you why." I believe this man did this and certainly why John Jones didn't. But anyway, 
if anybody is curious, have a listen the to the, our, that podcast. It's in the description of this episode. Uh, Thomas Murtadi, thank you so much. Roberto, thank you. Always a pleasure. Hope to see you again sometime. Okay, thanks. Take care.